Have you ever seen such tiny silly feet? Hello beautifuls, welcome back to my Chanel. Oh, hang on a moment. Oh wait, stop the video. Stop Biscuit, stop everybody. We need to do this. We are now filming in 6K, my lovely 6K, in the most glorious definition possible, girls. Although you will only be able to watch this in 4K on YouTube, my videos are now much higher quality because I have upgraded the studio equipment, finally, for the first time in years, in fact. Isn't that right, little Biscuitina? Yeah, I'm gonna be on the cover of Vogue. So, my lovelies, welcome back to another deep dive into the unhinged world of makeup TikTok fails. I thought, as I am working with brand new equipment in the studio, I would film one of these videos because they are a little bit easier for me to edit than a full-on two-hour extravaganza about America's Next Top Scandal Girls. And you guys absolutely love these videos, so why not make more, you know? Give the people what they want! Big titty lady videos on the internet! Marketing 101. Match the person to the product and they will probably want it. So my lovelies, in the last couple of videos we've done on this topic, we've seen some absolutely unhinged situations We've seen a thousand layers of gloop upon the face. We've seen super glued open eyes. We've seen skincare hacks that no one with skin should ever do, ever really now. And I expect today will be no different whatsoever. Is that right, Mr. Biscuit? Look at your really fluffy feet. What are we gonna do about all this fluff? You need to arrest him immediately. Why don't we strap in, strap on, and get ready for some madness, shall we, Biscuit? Do you want to go and sit on your little pillow whilst mummy does all of this on the internet? If you don't know me, my name is Lux. Area, and I have been a makeup artist for 16 years and I also have a biochemistry degree because I love understanding exactly what's going on in our bodies and what we decide to put on them girls. And through these videos I love to share my little bit of knowledge of chemistry and formulation into understanding why perhaps makeup can be used or can't be used in certain circumstances. Now while I might be a bit of a stranger to making short form content because my chosen form of communication on the internet is videos over an hour long trying to understand why we're such a generation of millennials. But that's neither here nor there. If you want to follow me over on TikTok, it is XXLuxaria. Tag me in any of the most unhinged beauty and makeup related hacks you've ever seen, girls. And I would love to watch them. With that being said, grab yourself a beverage. I am nearly out of this, so I'm probably gonna get some Pepsi Max, actually. Let's bring some inner peace and watch other people explode through theirs in anguish online, shall we? Gosh, she's actually a philosopher. <laughs> Deranged. Oh, so the first one here looks like a bit of a bleach situation. I am no stranger to a bleaching situation. My head hurts and it looks pretty white, oh. which is deceiving because it's got bleach on it, but it looks pretty light. It's been on for like five to 10 minutes and my head is burning. So guess what? We're taking it out and hoping for the best. I'm just, no, before, no, stop, stop. I'm just gonna say, I am not the like most knowledgeable when it comes to understanding the reaction that bleach undergoes on the hair. I am not an expert. I can sort of hazard a guess that the exothermic alkaline reaction kind of opens the cuticle and then the bleach gets in and lightens the natural underlying pigments all the way throughout the color scheme of like dark to bright orange to then like yellow and then to white. And then of course you put toners in because that's color theory because then you're putting like purple onto yellow to make it like kind of silvery white and that's how you get this. I've been doing my hair for as long as I have been on this planet, my loves. Only a handful of times have I gone to a salon or to another person to have them do my hair. Every single time I've been disappointed, so I always go back to my own skills, but I am Wella trained and I'm also Schwarzkopf trained in terms of their color lines. So what can we see about this lady with bleach on her hair? What can we see? The thing with using white bleach or blue bleach is it always gives the illusion that it is lighter than it is. I can actually see here that this is gonna be quite yellow. Before she's even rinsed it off, I think it's gonna be quite yellow and she's definitely either gonna need to do a round two or a pretty strong toner, depending on what color she wants to actually end up. Not everyone wants platinum blonde hair, I know, but do they really not want that? I mean- Don't be ridiculous, Andrea. Everybody wants this. What is that? The Devil Wears Prada? Uh, <laughs> At least a level nine. Let's go. Oh, that's not a level nine. So yellow. Oh, it's see. Like yellow. <laughs> no. Oh, she, mm. <laughs> Actually. I'm not sure about this. That might be a yellow nine. A yellow that's nine. That might be a level nine. No. Oh, it's 
difficult to say. I feel like in the hairdressing world, we have the level 1 to 10, and it should actually be like 1 to 20, because the difference between like 7 and 10 is so dramatic. There's like 30 different shades between that. There's not really a lot of difference between like level 1 and level 3. They're all just like really deep tones. But it hasn't lifted enough. Like that still looks pretty orange. Mm, uh, uh, what's, it, what's it called? Blonde. An Brassy blonde. So I, I'm really worried that I'm gonna put the T18 on. <gasps> Not well a T18. Are like whiter. Okay. Like roots. That's exactly what's going to happen. I'm very sorry. Well a T18 is a very interesting product. If you don't know, it looks like this. It's part of a permanent toner range that Wella does. It's got kind of a bit of a reputation. It's one of those ones of like, if you have really thick, strong hair, you can use it. If you have any other hair type, avoid. <gasps> it kind of utilizes slightly older technology in terms of like, it provides a little bit of extra lift in a toner itself, which seems really bizarre because a toner should be tone on tone level. It should be the same level or deeper. Technically, Wella T18 is kind of like a permanent tone, but I guess it must have a little bit of high lift technology in it if it claims to be like, well, go white girls. What I like to use as a toner for my hair is the Wella Illumina 9-60, I believe, with a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of silver mauve. And it gives me this gorgeous, color which I top up every now and then with the Paul Mitchell blonde tone shampoo it's got kind of like a slightly pink hue to it and it's one of the best purple toning shampoos I've ever seen because it doesn't really leave my hair like purple it kind of leaves it like dusky a dusky platinum and I love it I love everything about it right let's see I've interrupted this woman so many times we're only a minute into it and I'm sure as heck not leaving it like this oh it's not gonna tone so, I'm sorry fingers. no Oh, the panic I mean, of a toner. Just go, like, lilac. I've been doing my toning for so many years and I still this go, is Oh, is it going really dark? Oh no. Um, so I know that toner can be super deceiving yes. on your head. I mean, that. But, I mean, it looks no. like it's doing really well. I guess we'll just have to wait um, and see. It's only been on for like five minutes. I think minutes, some so parts of it will look really good. A little good. bit longer, maybe five like more minutes. That sort of platinum silver that she clearly wants. Yeah, because that still looks pretty orange. I don't know. Leave it for another like five minutes. Oh, at come least. on, girls. Oh! I feel like Daenerys. Okay. Actually, not hateful. I'm not mad about it. Nobody else seems to like blonde on me. Everybody says that like darker or orange family colors would be better. Any hairdressers in the audience think that this was gonna be the outcome? Because I 100% did not. I mean, it is slightly uneven, but you know, sometimes when you've gone through the rounds of bleach and then you just want to put a toner on, sometimes you don't really mind a little bit of like multi-tonal effects. I know in my hair, I have some warmth down here from some old highlights. There is no way I am pouring any more bleach through the ends of my hair because I like the length. So I can cope with it being a bit warmer there. I do my roots every five to six weeks and it does take me a full day. It takes about an hour and a half for me to put the bleach on my roots. It takes about three hours to process that. Then I do like a wonderful deep penetrating protein and Olaplex treatment and then I'll do my toner. And then I will blow dry and style my hair. The whole thing takes about eight hours. If you're gonna go bleach blonde, you gotta prepare. And I did not expect this. This is not a fail. And what an excellent time for for today's Twitch shout out, my lovelies, which goes to the Pie Fairy, Mr. Biscuits, the Pie Fairy. Thank you so much for following me over on Twitch, your stunning woman on the go. And if you want to be in with a chance of being featured in my next video's Twitch shout out, make sure you follow me on Twitch. It is Luxaria Plays, and I stream every Monday and Thursday, my loves. And with that, back to the unhinged TikToks. Oh, right, okay, what do we have here? Underpainting fail. Started off well. I realized I used too much light. Yes, that is quite a lot of light. Oh. Aggressively trying to blend it away. Oh no! <laughs> oh, yeah, this is not. Oh, is her concealer dry? Oh, yeah, no. No. Bro, what? No. No. No, it's not working, no. No. Oh, That beauty blender did look a bit like it hadn't been dampened. Oh dear, no, at this point I think it's a, a restart situation. Oh. 
Oh. No. Yes! It does work when it's done differently. I don't think the powder is going to be. Okay, so let's have a moment, shall we? Underpainting is a brilliant way of creating those natural contours or enhancing those natural contours underneath makeup in a really subtle yet effective way. One of the things is it is a practice skill. No one is ever perfect when they start anything at the beginning and I can completely understand. It seemed like as this makeup enthusiast was doing her makeup, she sort of realized some of the mistakes that she had made along the way. One, applying too much light. Too much light will always disrupt everything because when you go to put your foundation over the top, you'll actually end up mixing it all in and you'll end up with like an undertone that's not quite right for you. I also wanna say it does depend on the type of products that you use as well. For this kind of effect, I will shout to the high heavens that my favorite foundation of all time is the Estee Lauder Double Wear Foundation, the Double Wear Liquid. It is so Good. I wear it in every single video. It's the reason why my skin looks like this, although I am having a bit of a breakout at the moment. Thank you, hormones! That She's dead! So, you wanna start underpainting? You wanna get underpainted, bitch? What you need to think of is where you want the lightness on your face. Working in triangles always works really, really, really well. No matter your face shape, really, when it comes to underpainting, you kind of want to pinpoint the areas where you're naturally going to have shade and light. If you find it difficult to discern where those areas are, look right down in your mirror and you'll see where your cheekbones hit the light, you'll see where your chin, where your nose and where your forehead hits the light. Anywhere the light is not touching can be a contour. There you go. Easy, 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 easy. The way that I like to do it is put a very light layer of foundation over my skin. That way you've already got something a bit wet, a bit tacky for everything else to stick to. This is kind of after you've done your skin prep, whatever that looks like for you. X, X, X. Then I go in with concealer underneath the eyes. I don't actually drag my concealer out really far. I just put a considerable amount right here and a little dot in the middle of my forehead, some across the chin and some across my upper lip because I really like that curve that goes with lip filler. You'll find less product works better when it comes to underpainting because as you go to move that product around and move it into your foundation that's already there, if you've actually got concealer at the edge of your eye, you're gonna end up with so much lightness at the side of your head, which is where you don't want it. You want the contour to be that so you get that 3D gorgeous, perfect from every angle effect. Once you've blended in your contour and your highlight and any liquid blush if you really want to, if you're really that sort. Are you that sort? I actually also like to go in at this point just before I set my whole face with powder with a little tiny bit of highlight just across here. I actually find putting powder over my powder highlighter actually dulls it down and makes it look more like a glow from within rather than like an artificial stripe. If you love the artificial stripe, go for it my loves. Taking a small powder brush, powdering underneath the eyes first and anywhere that moves quite a lot and then going all over with a powder poof and you have underpainting done. What you then might need to do if you really want to is bring some warmth back to the skin by actually applying some bronzer or a little bit of blush or something like just across the cheekbones, maybe at the edge of the forehead and maybe down by the jawline as well. And that is underpainting. That's it. It sounds complicated, but once you get the skill down, it will make everything move so much faster. And you'll actually find you end up using less product in total because you're making each product harmoniously do its job rather than layer, 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 layer. She's got a B tech, girls. Me loving the lipstick right, I stole from my exactly. sister. This copyright music. Loving me the being lipstick confused I stole, girls. Because it's getting really dry. Right. Oh. Oh no, butthole lip. It literally starting to fall off. Oh no, what is that? What? Oh. No. Oh, no. Usually what happens with these kind of liquid lipsticks, the ones that are like really drying and they're meant to last forever, girls, they kind of start to get the lovingly known effect as butthole lip, which is where things are so dry that when you start to move, they start to flake and they get all like liney and start to resemble an aging twink bussy. Oh my God. Let's not go there. <laughs> 
if you find that you have a favorite, absolute favorite liquid lipstick that does this, the reality is with liquid lipstick formulas, they aren't hugely different from each other. They will have a different drying process and usually that involves a different kind of alcohol on the lip. So for example, one of the higher end, uh, long lasting, but slightly drying liquid lipstick brands that I can think of is the Beauty Bakery. I love their formula. It is so good, but I do feel like some of the colors, not all of the colors, some of them start to get a little bit dry towards the six hour wear mark. And to be honest with liquid lipsticks that are matte, you're probably gonna end up with something like that anyway. However, I have found a little makeup hack. So when I am wearing a gloss in my videos, it is a lie. It is not actually a gloss. I do not like lip gloss because I find my hair is like, oh, oh yes, I'll stick to my face girls. And I, <laughs> I hate it. That was not erotic to everybody. This is one of my most favorite liquid lipstick products ever. So on top of Beauty Bakery, I will actually take one of these. This is the Superstay 24 hour color by Maybelline, I believe, is it Maybelline? Yes, Maybelline New York. This, this end here, which is, oh goodness me, I've picked the filthiest one possible off my makeup desk. Of course I have, because I use my products. This end here is a balm. It is a clear, but shiny balm. Put that over the top of nearly every liquid lipstick and you will refresh it and it will look gorgeous. Ironically, they also do it as a standalone product themselves. This brand, however, is really good at creating a decent color and a gloss to put over the top. So it makes it look like you have superior long wear, slightly glossy, juicy lips that don't print off on everything around you and your hair does not stick to it. As I say, I actually find that it works really well if I put it over the top of something like Beauty Bakery. My other favorite brands are the Sephora own brand. I'm actually wearing it today. This is shade 80, I believe. And I also love to wear it over the MAC Retro Matte Liquid Lipsticks because it just gives a great finish. And it also helps hydrate when your lips are just feeling a bit like dry girls. And I'm not entirely sure what they've done with the formula of this specific balm, but it does not disturb the product underneath. I don't know how they've done it. It must be an oil-free formula because oil should dissolve liquid lipsticks and a balm you'd think would have an oil component, but I don't know how they've done it. It's magic. All right then, keep your secrets. Gosh, if that's not a sales pitch, I don't know what is, girl. Oh my goodness. Oh, look who it isn't. Nikki Tutorials, girl. I haven't seen her in ages. None of her content ever comes up on my YouTube anymore. What's this? Hang on, wait, wait, I've been chatting too much. What's this? A jellied eel? Jelly deals, everybody. Pigmented jelly eels. Oh my god. Ah! They come in a bunch of like crazy colors. Yeah, they even have this? a blue one, but the color I hate the most. Oh, it's a MAC yeah. product. MAC green. Got a green one. MAC green and you know jelly lip eels. Green, so I thought, let's try By this. Mac. These are called the MAC Squirt Plumping Gloss Stick. Okay, MAC. <laughs> let's uh, push her. A plumping gloss stick? A gloss stick. How vile. Up. Okay, maybe a little. Right. It doesn't pull back down. Oh, anxiety. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh what my a god! Terrible product. <laughs> These are so <gasps> soft, but not like in the. That looks like baby puke. What is going on? These are so soft. Oh my god! Why didn't they put this in like a gloss tube? You have like no control over these. Look at how gunked up it oh, is I in don't, some places. I, I don't. I don't appreciate. What the hell is going on with your eggs? Has she wiped a lot off? Because it's less green now. They said plumping. It's like I'm inhaling a whole bag of, of mint. Have you noticed? It's getting thinking. like, I don't know if she's wiping off in between takes, but she's getting like less glossy as the video goes on. Interesting. It could be behind the magic though. Right, what's the okay, blue Just one? for shits and giggles, let's try the blue. <coughs> Very minty. I am not feeling these. I'm sorry, Mac. No. <sighs> Uh, no, no. See, for some reason at the moment, because the makeup world is quite oversaturated with the idea of new products, there is a movement in the Western makeup community, girls. I'm trying to tap in on this idea of like makeup combined with skincare. And I feel like we first saw this kind of phenomenon, this trend, if you like, happening with Korean makeup and skincare because they really do pay attention to 
good, healthy ingredients in their products to kind of bring out the best whilst also looking the best from your skin, your lips, your eyes, whatever it is. I feel like MAC used to be a real trendsetter. They are probably still, in my mind, one of my favorite brands. They're one of the first sort of like mid to high-end brands I ever bought. I thought, you know, oh my God, I'm shopping at MAC. I must be a beautiful makeup lady now. When I was a teenager, absolutely loved it. They brought out some banging, absolutely banging products that were such a staple of my personal kit and my freelance kit for such a long time. And I just don't really find myself reaching for anything by them anymore, except the eyeliner and the retro matte liquid lipsticks. So I don't know why they've brought the idea of a plumping gloss tube, but we already saw Nikki exactly show the problem with putting something that's a jelly in a tube. As soon as you go to apply it, it's gonna ruin the applicator. Jellied things, jelly deals always need to be in pots. I feel like when it comes to product design, sometimes too many cooks can spoil the broth girls. Because when we have these massive teams, of people trying to formulate the next biggest thing. They start to look at slight gimmick angles rather than actually trusting in the product and trusting in the audience. I feel like we're starting to see it a lot with the makeup space right now because I think people are a little bit tired with constant releases. So you need to bring out staples. And a lot of these brands already have some of the staples. And unfortunately, a lot of the newer, younger competitive brands who are mostly sort of online don't really have the staple product. And that's why we're starting to see the makeup community break apart slightly. I feel like as soon as we hear marketing teams grab onto things like this product is viral, as soon as we're told that a product is viral, I feel like people nowadays are kind of a bit like, well, I don't really want to add another viral product to my viral product collection because I got too many on the go. And I completely understand because something like this, I would never reach for. It's difficult to sanitize. It's difficult to put on someone else, difficult to put on yourself, difficult to travel with. What if it ends up getting hot in your bag on a hot day somewhere? Gloop, gloop everywhere. You smell, <laughs> lipstick in my Valentino white bag. Hey, what's this? Every makeup girlie's worst nightmare, girls. What is it? What's the tea? Oh, liquid eyes, liquid eyes. How vile. Running liquid eyes, oh. Yes, unfortunately. I mentioned this in the last episode and there's just nothing. When your eye is like, do you know what? Today is the day I'm looking out the window all day, waiting for my husband to return from the war. Like you just, it's just, it's just, you just can't really do much about it. Refer to my last video for tips and tricks to help with a leaky eye. No. Make a primer Ooh, that don't do MUA shit. Who you really again? Catch a cup okay, from your Kydro Grip but fucking this? failed. This claims oh, to be oh, hydrating, goodness. but it's actually quite drying. Like your foundation will literally look more luminous with just moisturizer. Elf Tone Adjusting Primer was such a disappointment. It doesn't reduce redness like it claims, and it makes your foundation just slide right off. Most oh. of YSL beauty products are phenomenal, but this primer nice. did not do it for me. It's literally just a glorified moisturizer. Interesting. Okay, let's talk about priming, shall we? So primers, I feel like primers get a bit of a bad rap. I sometimes use a primer, sometimes I don't. It really does depend on the effect that I want to go for. I feel like there's been a bit of a misconception around the idea of primers. Technically, your foundation, if you buy a mid to high end range foundation, so something from like MAC, something from Clinique, something from Estee Lauder, I, uh, who else have we got? YSL, any of these sorts of brands. They should already have skin caring ingredients within their foundation. What they're trying to sell you is the idea of putting lots of silicone on your skin in a certain area to give the appearance it looks flat. Unfortunately, quite often, this can end up disturbing the way your concealer and your foundation look. Now, that's not to say that you absolutely should never use a primer ever. I do use a primer. The primer that I'm currently using, let me get it, my loves. I believe this is called the Startup Pore Primer by Time Walk. It is a Korean skincare based pore filling primer. I absolutely love this stuff. It does say pore primer to help make skin smooth as in Photoshop. I don't think it photoshops your skin. There is nothing on this planet that's gonna photoshop your skin in real life. You're still gonna see texture. You're still gonna see pores. You're still gonna see makeup 
makeup on the skin because makeup never looks invisible. What you're trying to do with your makeup application, your priming, your skincare, your foundation, everything is to minimize how much like makeup it looks, unless you're going for that look, of course. With a pore filling primer, that's exactly what it is. It fills pores. So don't put it everywhere on your skin. I like to put a little bit here and then massage it up underneath my eyes. Not putting lots underneath here because as soon as you start to put filling underneath here, I feel like it starts to exaggerate all of the smaller, finer, like movement lines everyone has underneath their eyes. I also like to put a little bit down here because I do have a little bit of texture that I could, you know, could do without, to be honest. And I like putting a little bit between my eyebrows as well for the very same reason. That is the only area I will put primer on. It does not need to go all over the skin. Unless, of course, you're trying to target a very specific thing. Maybe it's redness, maybe it's dry skin, any of those things. Primer needs to be considered in its placement and it needs to be used sparingly. Otherwise, I really do feel like it just makes everything look bad. I can't put primer on my nose. Regardless of how many pores I have, I just can't because eventually, after a few hours, it brings all the oil to the surface of my skin and my foundation just slides right off or starts to look cakey. Even with double wear girls! So yes, if you're going to use a primer, make sure you only apply it to the areas you feel that you need to apply primer. You don't have to apply it all over the skin and you certainly do not need to use as much as makeup retailers are telling you that you do. Okay, good. Ooh, what's this? Oh no, no, copyright, no, be quiet. Makeup Celebrity Fails Part 4. Right, what's this? Oh, goodness me. Oh no. America's Next Top Scandal Girls. Okay, so, okay, so, okay, so, okay, so. This looks like it's a slightly older makeup look, maybe from the mid 2000s, something like that. I feel like this kind of a thing was kind of in that sort of like smoked out grunge effect. The thing with something like this is, I always feel it looks a bit unbalanced when there's so much shadow and not enough eyelash involved. Like this would probably look okay if it was saved by a big pair of lashes that make the eye shape balance with how much eyeshadow we're seeing. That's kind of it, really. I mean, I guess this was in the era also of like, don't really do a lot with your brows. Anytime you have a lighter brow with heavier makeup, it always does look a little bit odd. And in certain circumstances, with the faux bleached brow effect, it can be really good and effective looking. But most of the time, it doesn't look that good. And I'm really sorry for saying that, but I, my opinion is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch! Right, who do we have next? Nicki Minaj, nose contour. <gasps> nose contouring. Nose contouring is one of the hard hardest things you can ever do on someone else because I feel like it's one of those things that personally develop over time. If you're a makeup artist, it's very unlikely that you're going to have one client see them once and do their nose contour absolutely perfectly on the first time. I'm sure every makeup artist in the audience here can agree. If you become a client's regular makeup artist, you can kind of see what works. You can become a bit more friendly. You can kind of spend that little bit more time finessing exactly a flattering contour for the nose, but it's a very difficult thing. In fact, actually, I would say nose contouring is kind of the hardest part about makeup for me anyway because as soon as a nose contour moves in 3d space the illusion can be immediately ruined by any misplacement of anything for example in this photo here i will also say this was an interesting choice of eyelash i don't know why it's just full-on batshit bonkers at the edge and then just like nothing from like the inner half interesting Oh, Claudia Winkleman. Claudia. Oh, Claudia. One too many Merlots last night. Oh, see, I do not think this is a fail. Leighton Meester. Who is Leighton Meester? What has she been in? She looks familiar. Oh, she was in Gossip. Of course she was. Oh, yes. I don't feel like this is a makeup fail. I feel like this is an unflattering photo. And I do feel like that is something to remember when we see some of these photos of celebrities. In the first... Uh, episode of this series that I started, we looked at, we saw a lot of flashback phenomenon, which usually happens with a silicon based powder because it catches the light and immediately reflects just like a mirror and causes like bright whiteness wherever the powder has been placed. That isn't necessarily a fault of the makeup artist. I mean, I, I guess it kind of is. If you know that flash photography is going to be taken, you wouldn't use a silicon based powder. That's just my opinion. That's not necessarily entirely the makeup artist's fault because it is just a phenomenon that happens in photography. You wouldn't see that in real life. This, I feel like, is an unflattering photo of makeup that is quite nice. Clearly, she's caught in the middle of a laugh here. I mean, 
Who looks glamorous in the middle of a laugh? British media have this horrible trend of making celebrities look like they're drunk when they're out with their friends having a giggle and someone's caught them going, ah ha ha, and then they've posted on the front page, lady is drunk, and she's like, ah, because she's having fun and giggling and they've caught a snapshot. This is one of those things for me where it's like, don't trust everything you see online, both for a good reason and for a bad. Sometimes things can look worse than they ever were in real life and sometimes things can look a lot better than they ever will be in real life. <laughs> I must admit, maybe the concept of blending quite a shimmery purple underneath the eye with such a like gold liner on the eyelid, maybe that's not exactly the most flattering look, but I don't hate it. I really don't. Again, maybe an eyelash could have really saved this look, but I love that red. That red for a lip, gorgeous. And she's just a little bit on the paler side. Nothing wrong with it, girls. No. Who else do we have? <gasps> Oh my goodness me, Christina girls! Okay, should we talk about Christina Aguilera's makeup here, shall we? This was a dark time, the plague. It was just a time in which it was basically full drag, just drop of the hat, full drag, every time they're on a red carpet. In the mid 2000s, there was a very interesting collection of makeup. It was, we hadn't really hit that whole idea of like, just, you know, clean girl aesthetic, just a little bit of lip gloss, bit of mascara, or maybe no makeup at all, no. We hadn't hit that at all. We were doing full on, bright orange, bronze, hot pink, lip gloss, bright blue eyeshadow, skinniest brows you've ever seen, but they're also jet black and uneven. And that is exactly what we see here. It kind of is giving that sort of MySpace meets the 80s meets glamour model. And that is a very interesting Venn diagram because it is just a circle of orange at the end of the day. <laughs> but I think there are some redeeming things about this. Like I actually don't hate the lip. I know I just was like, oh my God, pink lip gloss. I think a pink lip gloss actually looks really cute as long as it's like a working tone. I must admit, I'm not sure I quite agree with the applique of the pink, shall we say, but I like the lip gloss, and that's all I'm gonna say on that one. I think. So, my lovelies, I think I've seen as much as I can cope with today here on the Chanel, my loves. I hope you have enjoyed this little bonkers step down, I don't know, TikTok memory lane, is that a thing? My goodness, one day we're gonna say, do you remember TikTok? Do you remember me doing all that on TikTok? Oh, isn't that alarming? Oh, I don't like that. Existential crisis, girls. So what have we seen today, Mr. Biscuits? We've seen some hair accidents. We've seen some bleaching accidents. We're not going to put any hair bleach on you, are we? No, not even a toner. No, although he does have whitening shampoo. Just like mummy. Naughty mummy. So, my loves, let me know what you think about the absolute abject horror and nonsense that we have seen today, because... One thing absolutely does terrify me. Every single time I do my roots, I do always think, is this the time? Is this it? Is this the time that all of my hair falls out? Is this it? Even though I've been doing them for like nearly 20 years? Disgusting. And with that, my lovelies, it's time for the Patreons. You can see yourself scrolling past on the screen here. Yes, you can. And as always, I want to say a massive thank you to my top tier Patreons. Orcos Samoji, Beebles32, Shell Herman, Christy Crownover, Christina Kyle, ContraPoints, Danielle, Elizabeth Stone, Eric Castillo, Fable and Flourish, Jamie Clark, Jen Martin, Jennabeth Herman, Jin Woo Choi, Caitlin Wright, Laura Jane, Les Banana, Lizette Cares, Millie Hammond, Min Min TM, Mariah Sherman, November. Paolo Rivera, Rubix.co, Ryan Vita, Slampire Queen, Steffi Tech, The Chaos Collective, Victoria Carella, and Zoe Sevier. And you know what, my lovelies? I think I'm gonna leave it on the note of I've got a bucket of peace, sweetie!